Handheld mic, uh, but it wasn't working very well, so I'm going to have to use the, the actual podium mics. If you can take your seats, please, ladies and gentlemen. So I hope you enjoyed the first three quarters of the day today. Uh, there were some great sessions that I visited and, and uh, took part in, in small groups, in big groups, in main rooms, in breakout sessions, and of course, you know, I hope you enjoyed the... Uh, the networking. But this session we're looking at um, almost everything combined a little bit. We're looking at leadership. How do you inspire innovation and excellence? Because the conference, the awards last night and what we've discussed today is that the industry is changing uh, and we need the logistics and supply chain groups to develop uh, how they need to develop to be uh, the right supply chain organizations and logistics organizations for the new automotive world. So a big part of that is, is how, we lead, uh, how we lead the teams to take the industry forward. So we've been very lucky in getting three great executives uh, to share their views and experiences and plans on, on the, the, you know, developing uh, logistics teams and supply chain teams. The panel consists of uh, a car maker uh, from Opel Automotive, uh, a part supplier from Continental, Lagi, uh, and a logistics service provider from Jeffco. And what we'll be doing, it will be a panel discussion. So what we'll be doing is, is uh, it really is a, a very interactive Q&A where uh, there, there aren't any long presentations, so we'll be relying on, uh, on you uh, to share your thoughts and experiences and ideas on how you are building your logistics and supply chain organizations, how they should develop, who should be in them, what the organizations would look like in the future. Uh, so uh, we'll be using the app to collect questions, but most importantly, if it's really gonna be an interactive session, uh, just, you know, again, raise your hands, ask your question, make your comments, completely disagree uh, with the panel, uh, Andreas Graffer from, from Opel said that I would be too scared to ask him any tough questions. So we'll have to look at what we can do there. Uh, so, but uh, I hope you enjoy uh, and learn from the, from the discussion. At the end of the, of the panel discussion, we'll be having another voting survey, a series of questions to get your views on some of the most important topics on automotive logistics and world events. Uh, by world events, I mean the World Cup. Uh, so we'll be doing a, a, a very exclusive automotive logistics survey at the end of this session. So please make sure you're, uh, you're logged on to the app. Uh, you have, you'll also now find the evaluation forms on the tables in front of you. Again, if you're crazy enough to leave early today and not stay for the second day, please complete the evaluation forms. They're very important to us. We do take them very seriously. So please give us your opinions and th thoughts as we say, these are your conferences, not ours. So please tell us how you would like our conferences to, to change, improve, or uh, what your thoughts are. They're really very important to us. After the session and after the Q&A and after the voting session, at the end of this session, uh, if you'll join us outside for a drinks reception, there'll be a, a reception with some canapes and, and some snacks. Uh, just for a, a bit of time and then at 6.30 we'll start making our way, Six, just after 6.30 we'll be making our way uh, to the, the boat on the river uh, which is going to be a, and it'll be you know just, just here, we won't be walking anywhere, it'll be just outside. Uh, join us on the boat for a cruise of the Mediter Mediterranean islands, a uh, tour of uh, Italy and then via Hawaii. Uh, we'll be back. We'll be back by about nine, nine thirty. So please join us uh, for the exclusive uh, uh, cruise in in my yacht. But uh, apart from that, I'd let, then like to go on uh, to the session to find out the thoughts uh, of our leaders on the panel, to introduce a little bit themselves and some of their thoughts, and then we'll go on to the the Q and A and the discussion. 
So uh, I'll be joining you there, but I'd like to just start off by uh, asking Andreas Graffa to introduce himself and some of his thoughts, just initial thoughts on, on leadership and inspiring innovation and excellence and what your thoughts, one of the challenges or thoughts that you're going through looking at those kind of things at this moment in time. So firstly to Andreas Graffa, who's the um, Director of Logistics and Container Management from Opel Automotive. Thank you, Andreas. Okay, thanks, Louis. Is England qualifying for the championship, by the way? No, no, they're not qualifying, they're winning. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> we cover later on. <laughs> so, okay, um, yeah, my name is Andreas Graffe. I'm, as obviously being mentioned, working here for Opel, a little bit more than 20 years within the company, working in different functional areas, purchasing and supply chain responsibilities for the last six, seven years, um, heading logistics and container management. Um, had also some international experience working in Asia and in France, which is obviously helpful in current times. <laughs> um, and yeah, with regard to the topic here that we are reviewing, looking at from innovation management, um, I guess with regard to skills, capabilities that an organization should bring in. From my perspective, um, as, a, yeah, as a theme of supply chain and logistics is evolving, obviously more and more over time, um, the focus would be, from my perspective, more to have people that do have an end-to-end -end view within the total supply chain that are basically going beyond the logistics or the transportation management scheme, which is, as we know, already quite complex in itself. I know we had a lot of subjects discussed, not only this morning, but basically on all of the conferences, but the, let's say, I guess, more involving subject. From my perspective, is the interface with other functional departments and, and therefore really from a supply chain management perspective to have the end-to-end the end -end view and to have people who are basically having a good overview and uh, connection to related functions to really be able to develop integrated solutions within the company. I mean, I know we always as well need certainly um, subject matter experts on, on, on special topics uh, and we also need um, fields of, uh, as we, we talked about, driver shortage, etc., etc. I guess the overall field um, of business opportunities also for young people is pretty broad within a supply chain, but the end-to-end the -end view is something that is an, an add-on um, capability, I guess, that companies need to focus on and develop and to be able to respond to the, today's challenges in the world. Okay, thank you, Andreas. And then, uh, Andreas, <laughs> just, to, <laughs> just to complicate it for the moderator, Andreas Suba <laughs> from Continental, uh, for those of you who have visited our conferences in Asia, uh, Andreas has been a speaker at our, our conferences in, in China, in Automotive Logistics China, and I believe you've just uh, re returned from there. So maybe you'd like to give us some thoughts on initially just leadership and inspiration or an inspiring teams in China, and if, I don't know if it's possible, is it different, is it the same? Hmm. Yeah, it's different. <laughs> different. <laughs> Um, yeah, also uh, good afternoon. Uh, quick introduction. My name is Andreas Sober. I'm also basically 20 years in automotive business. Um, before the uh, assignment in China, which was now five years, um, I worked in also in different areas in, in the company uh, as a subsegment head for a, for a global product. I was uh, three and a half years in USA, Mexico for a plant transfer project and uh, basically yeah, worked all the 20 years, I think, very internationally and, and really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. uh, as it also gives a, basically a good view to, uh, to ourselves and, um, and made a lot of good experiences. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah going to China, um, it was initially uh, planned two years. Uh, it ended up five years, which is in our company the maximum, but basically the the targets there for the one my job was to oversee the uh, supply chain activities uh, for the automotive group of Continental, uh, which is basically uh, parts, components. So you may know the, uh, the tires, um, 
which is the initial product. But during the last, during the last 30 years, the company acquired a lot of um, uh, electronic uh, uh, companies, and basically that's now even the major or the bigger portion of it. Uh, so I was leading a, a team in Shanghai, uh, had a team in, uh, in Japan and in uh, Thailand. And um, basically yeah, we had 26 plants to oversee in uh, 10 countries. And even in Asia, there's a lot of uh, culture experience you can, you, can, uh, you can get. Yeah, in terms of leadership, um, my task basically was to develop the team. So it's basically uh, uh, self-sustainable in Asia and especially China and uh, basically develop uh, yeah, people, uh, hiring people, growing the organization uh, due to market growth we, we had, and, um, and basically also keep the people because uh, Shanghai, where I stayed, is a very competitive market uh, in terms of people, and you have to do uh, much more in terms of HR, in terms of branding and so on to, uh, uh, to be the employer of choice and uh, to attract the good talents. And uh, as we heard this morning, uh, there are very uh, a few in, in Europe, uh, but I would say there are even more fewer in, in, in China, uh, because um, yeah, based on, on the growth we experience, uh, based on the fluctuation rate, um, the uh, probably more or lower loyalty, uh, we even have to attract more and have to work more on these HR topics than, than probably uh, in, in other areas. And uh, that's also my spend my time basically around 40% or basically on HR topics also in the, in the role beside, uh, besides the daily business and the strategic work. Okay, thank you. And obviously we can see from the first two that talent uh, and human resources is, is a big, uh, as if is hugely important to the development of the, of the automotive industry. So uh, our next pan panelist is Stefan Millet, the uh, HR Vice Pre Human Resources Vice President from Jeffco. So I've introduced you, but is that your is that what uh, your interest is at the moment? So um, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for inviting me. So my second first name is Andreas. <laughs> okay, that's it. So I'll just if I just you say you have had some headaches with Andreas <laughs> one, two, and three, but it's better for you. Um, we, we looked at this uh, within Jeffco from um, a different angle. Mm -hmm. It was a time in our history where we um, became completely independent and basically for us leadership and innovation were combined into a quest for a form of DNA. We all know this individually. You, know, you ask your, yourself the question, why do I exist? What for? What's my purpose in life? Some are meant to be moderators, other HR. Um, we're all asking ourselves those questions, and sometimes we don't answer this question. It was critical for us to answer this question. So it was really looking at the why, and actually there were two different reasons for that. One, because when you work with your ecosystem, when you partner with your ecosystem, people don't work with you or buy uh, what you do. They also buy and work with you because there's an alignment in terms of purpose. And it's why you do what you do that people are attracted to. So basically, we asked our employees, the best is to ask the employees, say, why do we exist? What's our purpose in life? And we came up with something we, we really did not expect. Um, and we call this infinite proximity now. So what we basically say is that the reason why we exist is to explore infinite proximity with our ecosystem, which means building very close relationships so that we understand what's to be done. And also we grow and we grow for long term. It's not Profitability on short term is profitability and partnering on long term. And this was a complete change in terms of attitude and mindset. Mm -hmm. And this is leadership. Leadership is about creating this passion so that you have followership, because otherwise you're the only one. Right? <laughs> and um, very early on, we coupled um, leadership and, and why and the purpose with innovation. 
-hmm. And basically, we did what OEMs are doing when they design cars for some of them. We did some retro innovation. So I'm not going to tell you things that are absolutely new, but it's um, how you use them that is new. And it was about two simple things, listening and cooperating. Is this innovation? It is if you take the time to group people so that uh, collective intelligence is superior to the addition of each individual intelligences. So that's what we did. I can obviously go on and on and on and on for, for, for some times. But you know, when um, my, my colleagues talk about attracting talents, nowadays people are attracted by companies that have a very, very powerful and strong purpose. Millennials, so, and, and new generations, will have zero tolerance for companies that, for example, don't take care about their ecosystem or their environment. And we have to do something. We see how the planet is, and I'm not an activist, we're not activists <laughs> in that, but we have some duty and responsibility. So this is leadership for me. Okay. So maybe that's a good place to kind of start, uh, is looking at, at the talent coming through, and we'll start maybe at the beginning of the talent, uh, attracting uh, maybe students uh, to the automotive industry. So uh, one, of the, one of the reasons, firstly, talent is a big issue for us globally. Every single conference we have, you know, human resources um, is a huge issue. Yeah. It can be, can be two sides of it. I suppose there's a, I don't know what the correct word is, on the ground talent, you know, drivers, warehouse people and things like that. But I think in this issue, in this instance, we're going to be focusing more on logistics and supply chain kind of, uh, uh, you know, office, you might say, office talent. So, uh, and one of the reasons this sprung up as interesting for, for us is Christopher and I were at a student competition uh, in Detroit. Mm -hmm. It was sponsored by General Motors. The... The competition was based on a real automotive logistics challenge that they had, and they threw it out to the students to see how they would react. And amongst the students who participated were different universities in Michigan, in Detroit, in effect. And when we spoke to those students, although they entered an automotive competition, etc., etc., and they were based in Detroit, hardly any of them wanted to actually work in the automotive industry. They all wanted to work for Apple, Amazon, etc. I'm not even sure Uber existed in those days, uh, but they're the kind of companies that everyone wanted to work for. So how do we attract uh, people, uh, or, or has it changed? Are people attractive to the automotive industry when it comes to supply chain, uh, and how do we attract them? Uh, so again, I'll start with you, because Andreas, <laughs> Um, I'll start with you, Stefan, to see, uh, because you're on the kind of, on the coalface, you might say. Well, it's true that the, 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 the attraction is becoming increasingly difficult. Um, I think I would, I would differentiate OEMs and, and supply chain, mm -hmm. just because, um, as you said, um, when the students answer to those questions, they look at brands and basically, um, we have very powerful OEM brands. Andreas uh, being a representative, I mean, Opel in Germany is, is extremely uh, um, important for um, the German market. And therefore, uh, I think in terms of attraction, it helps. Supply chain has been for quite some time um, a, a career that was not considered uh, as being attractive. And actually, we make all of us, we make it more and more attractive because we deal with extremely complex solutions. And this is extremely appealing when I think about engineers, um, when they look at problem solving in terms of transport uh, schemes that can be pan-European, and this is um, quite appealing to them. I'd like to talk about the drivers for a minute because we very often <coughs> focus on, as you said, office or, or engineering or, or services job, but um, uh, truck drivers are absolutely key in our business, right? They, are, um, they have the responsibility of what's the most precious cargo is the finished product of the OEMs. 
And uh, what we did, and I'm not saying that this is something that everyone should do, I think it's, it was just humanly what um, for us made a lot of sense. What we tried to do is to increase the better working conditions for truck drivers. I think one of the participants was describing uh, this truck driver loading, unloading, uh, you know, under the rain, the snow, etc. And um, from our perspective, this is, this is not acceptable because it increases the rates of accidents mm. and basically you take a risk on the cargo that um, you, you're responsible for. The second thing is the drivers are extremely sensitive to the trucks that they will drive. In France, we had uh, major difficulties to attract drivers. And it was not a question of salary. It was 90% a question of what's the truck. <laughs> We've invested in, in a fleet of trucks, uh, 100 and, uh, 150, something like this. I will not name the OEM, but uh, it's a very well-known OEM in Germany. And um, basically, all of a sudden, we had so many people knocking at the door saying, wow, I'd be interested to work. And we did a couple of other things. So we added comfort to, you know, people leave, uh, the, 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 the truck drivers, they leave in the trucks yeah. for, a, for a week sometimes, right? So um, we increased the bedding conditions. Just this was amazingly, spec you know, uh, uh, attractive for, for, for the truck drivers. So that's what we did. But I want to be very modest about this because we also interviewed many truck drivers say, why are you not interested? Yeah. And basically, it helped oh, good, good. to figure it out. Yeah. Before I turn to Andreas Graffer, before we do that, I wanted to use the red and green card survey. Uh, so um, who actually wanted to have a career in automotive logistics at a young age? So if you wanted to be in automotive <laughs> logistics, you know, fr from a career perspective right at the beginning, uh, green, if you fell into it accidentally, then red. Okay. <laughs> so the majority really, not, probably not even as strong a majority as I thought were red cards. So that means we didn't choose to be in automotive logistics. It's interesting. Yeah. Very good exercise, actually. My next question is... Whose children are working in automotive logistics or who would want their children to work in automotive logistics? So green if you want them to work in automotive logistics and red if you prefer them to do something else. I see some of my teams here <laughs> and they're allowed to answer. <laughs> It's interesting, I, I'm not even sure because I'm colorblind, so I couldn't tell the difference of the car. 50-50 much. But, um, no, I think, was it 50-50? But it, it was close, it was, it was relatively close. Yeah. And that's actually quite encouraging. I, I really thought it would be the opposite. I really thought that there'd be more red cards. So that's good. I just wanted to make sure that we believe. You know, it's all right. You know, how do you convince someone else to join your industry if you don't believe sure. uh, in your industry? So, um, so no, that, that was good. That was a, a good, interesting exercise. So, Andres, how do you, uh, how do you, uh, how do we convince people that automotive logistics is a great industry to be in? I mean, if I saw the, the voting, I, mm. I found it interesting that I guess there were a lot of people who didn't have predominantly the initial desire to move into mm. that field and then basically are ending up in it or yeah. basically are falling in love, however you want mm. to put it. Um, I guess that the field obviously has a lot to, to offer, be it because you control financials, you basically oversee a lot of links within an organization or within a function or an enterprise. Um, you are able to work on complex subjects. So, um, I mean, mm. again, it has a lot of, a lot of things to offer. And um, I guess the intention should also be to not only focus and try to attract people who basically have that educational background of supply chain management or logistics management from, let's say, university, if we talk about the office, mm -hmm. office stuff, but basically also look at related, related um, educational background, be it IT or 
be it sales related aspects. Yeah. And at an early stage within okay universities, I mean focus or try to 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 bring those people in already mm -hmm. and assign them tasks. And I don't know because you talked about the exercise in mm -hmm. In, in Detroit, if the people um, were basically supply chain management or logistics people, but something like that to be done with people who have maybe a different educational background or a different university approach, and then give them, let's say, one of the complex logistics tasks or supply chain yeah. management tasks, and um, I guess that would be a good starting point to get them interested that they understand that there's much more also in regard to complexity behind the topic that we all face quite often or every day then probably some of those people might have in mind when they think okay what is a typical task of a supply chain or logistics person in an organization yeah. mm -hmm. so the diversity i guess is important and they probably bring also a lot of innovation and creativity into such a function um, because we do not need necessarily only the subject matter experts, but then also people with a view of from, from other areas to bring in, again, new ideas and links between a supply chain organization and other functions in the company. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to Andres Suba, uh, again, I'm leaning more on your Asian and Chinese experience in this instance. You know, uh, if you go to uh, a supply chain school uh, globally, definitely in the UK and America, a good number of the students will be Chinese. Mm. So uh, I suppose uh, uh, the interest in, in supply chain from, from China and is automotive considered a, 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 a go-to industry? I mean, you've got some great companies out there, Alibaba, JD.com and others that, that might be the attractive ones. Yeah. I would still say yes. I think... Um if I look, if I compare Europe and, and China, mm. I think uh, automotive or cars are still a status symbol for people, and mm. uh, basically the market is now the, the largest market in the world. So, um, and basically also, we always hear this, uh, um, yeah, as an engineer and so on. I think that uh, that attracts people. Uh, to learn and also to meet basically the uh, yeah, foreign foreign culture as well in this, this collaboration yeah, as uh, most are, are joint ventures and um, that's basically I think still uh, still okay um, as we have here sometimes maybe a shift towards uh, that, that, that people don't think a car is, uh, is any more needed uh, I think in China it's still even in, in cities like Shanghai where you cannot really uh, drive a lot. Uh, yeah. it's, it's even part of the culture to have something and you can imagine how much uh, luxury brands you can see there on the streets. And, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I would say this is uh, definitely a given. I think it's, uh, as I mentioned before, it's, uh, it's, it's about leaders really. Also, mm -hmm. um, I think uh, people really also look uh, who to work for. Uh, and they have many options, yeah, they can, uh, can basically still go to other companies and as I said, the loyalty is not, not uh, is so much uh, dominant than in Europe. And uh, for you basically, yeah, the, you keep the motivation, you can basically, uh, you have a lot of energy in, as you mentioned, Alibaba and all this. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, there are some ideas which are catched up, and, but basically uh, there's, there's so much motivation in the in the society to, to move the things forward. And uh, I think for us as a leaders is also the task to, to catch this motivation and, mm -hmm. and give people tasks um, like an entrepreneur in, in the organization and support them, coach them, and um, basically show them uh, being successful with that. And then basically they can also develop their leaders. And that's mm -hmm. basically uh, what our task is because our time is limited. Um, but basically to build up a sustainable uh, leadership and basically also a sustainable uh, a group there. Okay. And, and on the subject of China, really, uh, I've got some relationships with JD.com and they're really trying to become innovative. I heard something like they're building, f I can't remember, was it 500 mini airports just for drones around China and things like that. Yes. So can you see China's logistics and supply chain becoming more, maybe the best, because they're investing in technology, there's the hunger. Uh, do you think, or maybe it's just because they're new, it's a new industry, 
that therefore they can immediately go to, into new technology as opposed to the, the legacy systems or technology that we've got at established car makers. Mm -hmm. I think one decisive thing is, uh, is probably speed. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, I mean, I was also joining in, in China some of the uh, startup events, so there are some, some uh, conferences where uh, yeah, basically startups, new companies, uh, show their ideas in a, in a pitch. And it's amazing how, how, how quick, uh, or how good ideas are coming out of mm -hmm. this. So I think the environment is uh, um, also in the way uh, to try out something and um, maybe not always asking, okay, that doesn't make sense or this doesn't make sense, but basically be a pilot or doing a pilot. And uh, I think there's a lot of uh, energy you can, you can catch. And um, sometimes I also have to say, in, in a big corporation like us, uh, there's a little bit more freedom uh, to be a little bit far away from the headquarter. <laughs> and uh, a lot, you can imagine, a lot of business units, uh, they also asked us to do a pilot for certain innovative uh, projects uh, because they were too afraid to, to implement this in Europe first. Yeah. But maybe uh, do it in Asia and see how it works and then we can basically take it, uh, take it globally or take it back to Europe. Mm. And, um, yeah, for that, I think uh, there's, a, there's a good opportunity mm. to take. You know, I heard an example at our American conference where uh, Mercedes, uh, were talk Mercedes trucks, Daimler trucks were talking about uh, they were wanted to experience on 3D printing and some other innovations. And to get it done quickly and efficiently, he actually outsourced it to his Indian IT team. Yeah. Because uh, they were hungry, prepared, and I'm sure, you know, not against the European or the American teams, but he managed to get it done more quickly through his Indian team uh, than rather doing it through, through Europe or America. Uh, and then just on the subject of, of the students again, millennials. You know, we talk about what we need to do to attract the millennials. Um, you know, I've even had a conversation with... Uh, with someone in my family uh, who was saying, you know, that millennials, uh, you know, you, Silicon Valley, they all start work at 12 o'clock and they've all got pool tables and they've got, you know, whatever they've got, you know, and this kind of stuff. And it sounds great. Uh, are we uh, following their rules, uh, following the trends correctly? And do we understand the bigger picture? Because one of the things I had to say was, yeah, it sounds great. Yeah, they do start work at noon or one o'clock in the afternoon. But then they work for 24 hours, non-stop, you know, and then, you know, and then they have, you know, after that. So it isn't as simple as it sounds. Are we uh, just following the trends uh, because of everyone's going for the simple option? Or should we actually say to millennials, okay, you know, that sounds great, but you've got to understand if you're gonna build a career, if you're really gonna be a leader, if you really wanna develop in any industry, you've got to work the almost the old uh, maybe the old-fashioned way is not right because we want to encourage startups and so on but uh do we do we need to get the right talent in do we need to change to suit the millennials or do we have to get the millennials to understand that business is business it isn't about bean bags and pool tables and things stefan so um so yeah there, there's the, the the actually there's a lot of surveys on millennials hmm. I got um, a couple of comments on this. The, the first one is that um, millennials have expectations that probably everyone has <laughs> today in the, in the workplace. Yeah. Like, for example, more flexibility. Second, more empowerment. I mean, unless you're talking about entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. which is very important for uh, millennials. Um, and I think we can probably develop some ways of working that um, can be seen as attractive by millennials. But our real big challenge is the cross-generation management. Because when in a team you have two millennials, a couple of people who are 35 to 40, and then a couple who are 55 plus, <laughs> you need to find something in common that make these people work together. It's not that easy. So empowerment is one. Cooperation is another one. Mm -hmm. And I come back to what I was saying earlier, is that why do I work here? What's the purpose? And, as, as, and when you have those three elements together, you can design like uh, a bit cafeteria uh, 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 ways of working. So someone will have shifts 
that probably don't look like the other one, <laughs> but they work together. Mm. People will work remotely, right? It's not working from home anymore. It's working <laughs> wherever I want to work, yeah. right? So um, we have to respect that. This is a trend, and we have to look at, and that's what we're currently doing, and, and what they do have in common. I'd like to come back to one thing that yeah. we said earlier. It's about loyalty. I think, Andres, you mentioned the, the, the word. Uh, loyalty meaning once you've attracted the talents you want to attract, which is not an easy task, um, you better be able to retain them, right? Otherwise, it's, it's a lot of money uh, yeah. thrown to the window. Yeah. <laughs> and I was very pleased to see that 50% of this room said yes. Uh, my kids, I mean, if I have an advice, say join, join the, 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 the industry, mm. right? Why? Because loyalty starts at recruitment. And if you use, as we tend to do it, referrals, mm. meaning that someone refers someone else, etc., mm. this is very powerful. And basically we see that the length of stay um, and the velocity of promotion of the people who have been referred is higher than the others. Okay. And what do you look for in students? You know, do you go for uh, the supply chain management students? Do you look for, I don't know, computer experts now? Uh, do you look for analysts? Do you look for, I mean, you know, I think Ford in Russia at one stage about three or four years ago, because as the Russian industry had a downturn, they were actually hiring physicists, yep. you know, and people like that because they could. Yep. Um, to give it a try. So who would you, you know, it, should it be a, a typical supply chain student? We mentioned this supply chain competition. Are they the people we want? Or do you want a new breed, a, a different type of person to become the supply chain leader of the future as we talk about digitalization and things like that? Mm -hmm. I think uh, also we have now some activities around Industry 4.0. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. this, uh, I would say, for. I studied mechanical engineering in the past, but probably uh, I would advise today probably big data analyst. I think that is something um, that the people are simply not there, but there's such a high demand to do into predictive analysis, as we mentioned this morning. Uh, we have huge, um, huge topics with uh, demand planning and supply chain, uh, how to how to generate the data, how to predict, how to make prediction out of it. We have uh, long lead times in this supply chain, so that is some is a big area mm -hmm. where currently I think uh, people are uh, suffering in the in the daily work. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're still working with Excel or some other function, but basically getting this predictive analytics into the supply chain. I think that's that's a key initiative for us in the in the industry for zero uh, initiative, and we have created. Uh, which is supply chain is part of it, but it's also operation, uh, purchasing, quality, they're all part of the industry for zero council mm -hmm. uh, to look at these uh, new technologies. But uh, today, basically, these, uh, these functions are simply not, not so on the market and there will be a big, uh, a big need for that the next years. Mm. Yeah. And Andreas Graffer, what, do you, what are your expectations on the, on the education or you know, for working within uh, logistics? Yeah, was partially mentioned already with regard to um, the, let's say, combination on the one side, you need certainly subject matter experts, I call mm -hmm. them, who are basically able to, to do complex analysis, uh, analytics, uh, data management, and, um, but at the same time, and again, a variety. And if you then talk about more leadership skills, I mean, you don't need the leadership who is basically able to to create your network or to to do the data management themselves, but that they do have the ability to look beyond the the part of the business and see more the broader picture of activities and are able to look more broader on 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 the elements and the related subjects uh, influencing um, the overall business. So um, it depends on the topic and the area that you need to cover. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a combination of, of different skills being needed and um, I guess the, the business is developing in a, in a way that you need a relatively broad field of 
of expertise and educational background in whatever type of special function you uh, want to cover. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd just like to open it up to the audience uh, if you've got any questions, perhaps particularly on the kind of student -y side, but I mean, I've got a question at the front here. The front's this end of the room. Sorry, thank you. That's what happens when you've got a team of logistics handling, handling the microphones. <laughs> You're going to sit there? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't sit down quickly, Chris. Be a lot yeah. of fun. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions, actually, but maybe we can start with um, the so-called gig economy. Um, it's something I believe uh, Monsieur Macron is quite a fan of. Um, so basically the use of temporary workers, um, using things freelance. Where do you see the role of the gig economy in automotive logistics? And Stefan, maybe we can start particularly uh, with Jeffco, because this is, I can imagine, I mean, there's aspects of it which would be very applicable to the kind of work, but then, I mean, the unions wouldn't particularly like it so much. So um, maybe a few comments on that. It's a, it's a very good question. I think, um, and I will connect this with the question you asked, Louis, is, is basically how do we prepare um, for a world that becomes so unpredictable? <laughs> and the speed doesn't help. I mean, you see, four years ago, China was just looking at drones, and now they are dominating this market. Mm. It's, it goes so quickly. I was looking... Um, at the other panel with uh, what's within the three years range, what's within the six years range, what you believe in will probably be beaten by the acceleration in technologies, in societal um, changes. What we see emerging is a hybrid um, working status. Um, people who are not permanent, employees who are not um, temporary employees, but who can be self-employed, who could create their uh, company. I mean, truck drivers in some countries, it's typically the case. Um, and navigate from a status to another, depending on basically who they work for. So how do we prepare for that together with um, basically the society in general, is um, basically looking at um, what contract means. And at the moment, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's a lot of futuristic kind of work. Some countries are more advanced than others. UK, for example, is historically very, very advanced with a, a number of self-employed um, micro companies uh, that is huge compared to France or Italy, for example. Um, so we have to prepare for this, and again, um, what people want is express more and more their uh, entrepreneurship. That's why they navigate between the different statues. So we need to look at something that could, um, I think, socially be acceptable, because you don't want to underpay people, you don't want to place people at risk, um, you don't want people not to have any coverage for medical, for example, etc. cetera. Um, in the meantime, I think some countries like France, like Germany, they try to help because it's a very positive spirit um, to become entrepreneur. So it's, maybe it's not the answer you expected, but um, that's how we look at it. Yeah. Anything to add, any of the Andreases? Also, we have, also to, uh, to keep this entrepreneurial spirit, um, hmm. We also have uh, started last year actually to build up a startup within our company. So that means uh, people uh, can go. And I think I, I saw it yesterday also in, in Telecom. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's uh, quite familiar now that basically there are a lot of ideas also by the, by the young generation. And they basically can, can go for certain months into, a, into another world. They can go basically in a startup but not losing the sure. security of the, of the company. Yeah. And uh, maybe they can then exit and be becoming an entrepreneur in this, yeah, with their own business. But um, there's an always a chance to come back. But at least that's also a benefit for the company, basically to get, generate these ideas from the own employees uh, for maybe future businesses we have. Hmm? And, and traditionally, we are a, a component. Uh, we are delivering components, but we are basically also going now more in we call it servitization or going mm -hmm. in service models. And uh, I think there's uh, there are a lot of ideas already created last year, 
and um, I think the initiative was, was quite successful. Yeah. That's, so that's one idea. Uh, the other idea is, of course, you can, uh, if you are fed up with supply chain, you can also basically work in another area in the company, and uh, and you can basically also uh, change globally. I think that's that's also a motivating factor. Yeah. Anything to add, Andreas? Or yeah, <coughs> I mean, level of flexibility, I guess, is increasing much more than mm -hmm. before because, I mean, you don't have to execute your tasks necessarily out of the office. Basically, you can mm -hmm. do much more remotely at different time zones due to connectivity and um, managing the business in particular in a supply chain or logistics area in a much more flexible way than it had been years ago. And I guess that is probably also what will evolve the, the industry and uh, a workplace over time much more because the capabilities are there and the, and the capability to, to run that business in a much more dynamic and flexible manner. Mm -hmm. And of course, the best thing about flexible working is you don't need cars. You can work from home. <laughs> I don't agree. <laughs> uh, just a quick sort of follow-on, I suppose. Um, I mean, uncertainty is always a part of, of any economy and any industry, perhaps automotive more than others. Um, there are companies on stage which are going through their own uncertain times. I mean, Opal being acquired by PSA last year certainly raises questions for some employees, certain plants. I'm not asking you to comment on that, but in the terms of, of, of managing a workforce and, and through uncertain times and through periods of transition, um, do you have any kind of points on, on how, how you're doing that? Because you need to be honest with your employees as well, uh, or what they might be facing, but at the same time, um, it's, it's certainly a challenge. Mm. Of course, we, we focused a little bit on bringing new people into the industry. But in the meantime, there is an existing workforce that needs to be inspired and, uh, and so on. So uh, how do you... Uh, the challenges of leading the existing, inspiring and leading the existing workforce through challenging times, but, you know, but not, not even necessarily challenging times, but changing times, because for sure the industry is changing. So... We'll start with Sub Mr. Suba. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, if I go back to this industry for zero topic, actually, uh, okay, we are a unionized company, at least in Germany. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, there are a lot of talks with, with the unions. What, what does it mean? Yeah, uh, there are also concerns about the, uh, we heard this morning, the fork truck driver, but, but other functions. Mm -hmm. There's a concern, okay, I mean, is this only for young people or are we doing all these offers for young people or what about the, mm -hmm. the mid-age or uh, mm -hmm. those retirement people? And basically, of course, there's, uh, there's always a diversity, not only in gender, but also in age, which basically uh, uh, drives teams to the, to the best performance. So how to attract the, the old guys and basically going into these areas, I think that, that will, be a, will be a challenge. But... Um, but I think uh, it's maybe also uh, something we just need to try. I think there are also a lot of ideas uh, coming and um, losing that or only looking at the young, genera the young uh, entrepreneurs, I think, then we're missing the chance actually to get this knowledge as well into the, into the play. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's basically... Uh, with the discussions uh, with the unions, I think uh, it was also a lot of concern in the beginning, but actually they were also quite uh, quite supportive for ideas because they also see where the, where the trend goes and uh, it's better to drive the change than to uh, to, to get driven. And um, sure. and that's, uh, yeah, I think, quite successful. Mm. Andreas, because you've got the, the change and the company change and the industry change. Yeah, and Christopher was certainly alerting here to, to us where mm. I wouldn't say necessarily that there's uncertainty, but certainly we are in a world of transformation mm -hmm. and in particular, let's say, our company because we're obviously in, an, in an changing our setup and, and aligning our way of, of the business. So with the people and the team is obviously here to, to look that this is also an opportunity. I mean, every change also bears some <coughs> potentials and opportunities for going into something new and, and basically changing the way how probably things have been done for some time. And I guess that's, that's part where everybody needs to be 
adaptive tool. I guess there will be no industry that is standing still and where you yeah. will have to do something in the same way how you did it for the last 20 years. Mm. Um, so I guess that's where everybody has to become more familiar with and adapt to that things are changing and to see this also in a, in a positive manner. And I guess that is also the key message that we from a leadership perspective have to communicate and have to ensure that the people understand this in a, in a positive manner and give them the ability to, to adapt to this change and bring in their own ideas as well into that type of um, evolution, I would say, in, when companies are having the type of transformation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes seen change as a threat or change as an opportunity. Yeah, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah the, the world is, uh, is changing, as we all said. I mean, it's not news for anyone here. And we have the famous uh, acronym called the VUCA, right? Uh, probably everyone has heard about this. So the world is now volatile, uh, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. So it's not only about uncertainty, it's about all those four combined. Um, we, we, we are very fortunate to have worked deeply on our uh, purpose. Because basically when everything moves around and you basically cannot predict um, what was probably predictable in the past, mm. when you know why you do what you do, it gives you some um, confidence. And basically that's exactly what Andreas was talking about in terms of positive mindset. You look at issues differently. You look at opportunities. Obviously, there are issues. But you look from a mindset uh, uh, a bit differently, like um, you know, a glass that is half full versus uh, half empty. And, and, to, to, and basically, to federate the energies of our different people, we just say it's not basically a transformation. It's, I will paraphrase a, 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 a German philosopher, Nietzsche, it's, it's really become who you are. So this is who we are, let's become who we are. So basically when you are going through a purpose-led transformation, it's about opportunities all of a sudden, less about difficulties. I'm not pretending that everyone is saying, yeah, that's great. I mean. Everywhere we have skeptical people, which is quite normal. It's part of the diversity. Mm. But um, most of our um, people are basically embarked on this journey. Mm. Well, very good. So for me, I, I know who I am. I just don't know why I am. Ah. Which is, so I don't know who that would we be. We can work on this after that. a glass of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Any questions from the audience? Right, from the old gentleman in the second row there. Uh, Alistair Newton, Automotive Logistics. Um, just really to give a bit of experience, I, I worked for Automotive Logistics uh, with Louis and the team for three years, and then I left and worked for a startup out of Redwood Shores. And it was a question of um, work to live or live to work. And I guess what we're competing on within our industry is, is the lifestyle. I mean, we went, within three years, we were the fastest growing tech company in North America. We, I was employee number two in the UK, and within three years, we were at 1,400. We were recruiting in Bangalore, and if you signed up on the day, yeah. we would give you a brand new BMW. So money wasn't, the, the, the money wasn't the problem. It was because they wanted to go to Oracle, or LinkedIn, or Facebook. Yeah. But then if we come back to the, the bean bags, and our own bar, and the pool table, and the masseur who came in three times a week, we, it, was, it was a lifestyle that you were buying into, and I think this is a PR exercise as much as it is to, to get the right talent in, because if you, you start getting the right talent in, it'll attract additional talent. And another thing, based on the experiences of the, um, the conferences that we do around the world, is we have the opportunity to speak to a lot of people. And a recruiter was telling me in the US, he said, in 10 years' time, Alistair, 50% of the people employed globally in automotive will be retired which is phenomenal. And you think, well, how are we going to fill that space? And it, it, I, it does come down to a PR exercise, I guess, communicating with the colleges. And there are a number of logistics service providers who work very closely within that sort of network. But Germany does it extremely well. You get that experience where you do four days in the office and one day within education. And it gives you that sign. But my, my three daughters just think, I just bring back 
um, toy trucks and squeezy balls and frisbees. Uh, and th there's a bit of fun to it, but um, I guess the challenges for, for our industry going forward is how do we encourage, I know we've generically used the millennial word, but it is that younger generation, and is it about having a logistics board game and trying to encourage both guys and girls at a young age, this is what happens, because the other problem we had um, that was mentioned was the legacy system. So you get the talent in, and then because they get embroiled in the politics and bureaucracy that, you know, if it ain't broken, we're not going to fix it, they just move on and go to FMCG or pharmaceutical or, or high tech. And it, I think it's trying to invigorate the next uh, generation within our audience to say, come and have a look at automotive because it's great fun and, and there's always problems to solve. Thank you, Alistair. And it's interesting because uh, Alist Alistair has been working with me for a number of years and I think it's the first time I've ever agreed with anything he's said. <laughs> but um, I think his first point is on PR. I do think automotive, automotive logistics, automotive supply chain does need uh, a kind of PR. We almost need to hire a PR executive to kind of say automotive logistics, automotive supply chain needs a great industry. And before we do it outside, maybe we need to do it inside to make sure that our bosses know that automotive logistics and supply chain is a, is a really important industry. If I hear it mentioned again as a waste or a cost center and how do we you know, eliminate it, it drives me crazy because without good logistics, none of the great things that the car industry does can happen. So I definitely agree on the PR point. And also at our conference in Detroit, what we do at some of our conferences, we've done it in Mexico and the United States and other areas, we have students coming in about 50 students and we have five or ten executives talking to them and sharing ideas going both ways about what, why we think they should join automotive mm -hmm. and why they don't or do want to, or what they're looking for in their career. The last one in Detroit, we had uh, the head of logistics from Tesla in that session and he was getting all the questions <laughs> because he, you know, they thought Tesla sounds sexy, you know, so... Um, uh, so it is a very much a, a, a kind of PR exercise, so I agree on that. Um, so are you going to yeah, say something? Tesla, it's, it's quite an interesting, um, an interesting OEM, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and Before you say anything, just check if they're a client or not. You might want to just double no, no, check. But it, it just, uh, I, I just want to emphasize the power of the a purpose that is basically there. Mm. And that's what Elon Musk is saying all, all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. he is producing 100,000 cars, mm. something like this. And the capitalization of the company is mm. superior to General Motors, which yeah. is the first mm. uh, car producer in the world, isn't it? Mm. Um, it's quite interesting. So why do you think people are valuing Tesla as much as they value Tesla? I think Elon Musk obviously is, is a very charismatic leader. Yeah. But he's got a purpose that is so powerful that people buy it versus looking at really what he's producing or what kind of value uh, the Tesla is producing today. So, see again, I mean, I, talking about PR, um, okay, but um, I think looking at really the passion for automotive that we have all. Mm -hmm. and um, this industry meeting the new needs for the future, I think this is extremely appealing to everyone. And probably we are on the verge of a form of revolution in, yeah. in, in, in the car industry as well, which, is, which can be very, very interesting for millennials to participate into something that in 10 years from now will say, wow, this was quite a revolution what we did. Yeah. And, and it's the language as well. When you see interviews with Elon Musk, he'll talk about, you know, whatever it is, all the crazy ideas that he has. Mm. When you hear interviews with other car maker executives, the main thing they often talk about is cost cutting. So, you know, th that doesn't necessarily attract you. Uh, <laughs> but the new, the new industry that's developing this mobility and all this kind of stuff, I think, will make automotive... Uh, a sexy industry in the future. And if there's any, any doubt, you only have to look on the panel 
uh, here that automotive logistics is definitely a sexy industry. That goes without saying. <laughs> I guess a combination of logistics and automotive is yes. always or yeah, yeah, will yeah. be or I mean Yeah, you're right. As maybe we shouldn't we are... sell supply chain, we should sell automotive, maybe. As a as an attraction to our industry, perhaps. Um, and the other thing of course, if you do want to work in the industry, I would say that uh, working for a car maker and in logistics is better than organizing events on logistics. The three guys with hair work in logistics. The guy, the old looking guy on the end organizes events, so I can tell which industry is the easy one to be in. <laughs> but um, what about, uh, you know, we, we talked about the current kind of, the, the employment force that you've got now. Uh, and one of the things that people like, we talked about, was empowerment. Um, do we allow people in our organizations to focus on strategic initiatives and innovations, or are, is everybody, including ourselves or yourselves, even at the higher levels, so focused on today's problems, you don't have a chance to stop and think about you know, strategic initiatives and innovations? Mr. Graffer. Well, I guess we all recognize that the day-to-day -day business is often catching more of our attention than probably looking at, um, at the longer term horizon. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, in preparation also of the session here with regard to talking about innovation, so how is innovation being managed within a company or within, within a department on functional area? Um, I mean, my view is certainly that you need to have a dedicated team that is able to, to pull the time aside and to look and focus on elements like this. Uh, which is quite a challenge, certainly, because again, you, we all are limited with resources and the focus is then more on, okay, maintaining, keeping the business running and it sounds to be like a luxury to basically have a team of people being dedicated to focus on, on the future or work on uh, industry 4.0 or other elements because, okay, what is the immediate return of investment, if you want to say so, in yeah. that aspect. But I guess that is critical to have innovation teams that are that do have the ability to, to focus on. And um, I guess that's key in order to, um, to ensure that there is an evolution of the business taking place within your company and that you have the ability to, to, to move forward and to look into future trends and basically are able to follow on that one. Mm -hmm. But I mean, again, certainly a challenge from what I can, can say from, from our setup, not sure how, how other view it, but um, to basically have that type of <coughs> setup being installed within, an, within a department, within a function. Mm -hmm. And I've heard conversations with senior logis logistics executives I'm going to really try and say this without naming the company name, although it could be anyone, genuinely could be anyone. But they said to me, we've got an, an ABC issue. So we're going to have an, an ABC company uh, meeting of ABC company executives to find an ABC company solution to the ABC company problem. You can't do that anymore. There's got to be yeah. you know, uh, broader insights and, and get you know, outside views as, as well as just going looking at the same problems, you know, in your office and so on. But to Andres Suba, what about, you know, did, did you, do you focus too much on the day-to-day? -day? Do you yourself, even at your level, focus too much on the day-to-day -day as opposed to looking forward? And do you allow, how can you develop your teams to have that mindset or the time to think strategically and think innovatively? Yeah. I think that the question we discussed since five years in our, our team, our global team, uh, as, a, as a corporate function for logistics, so basically we, we, we are a support function for plants and uh, you have basically daily, uh, you have the daily functions in the plants as so we are also very decentral organized. But however, we, our team is very much operational involved in, in uh, mm. uh, allocation topics, uh, material shortage, uh, deliveries and so on. Because simply the market is a uh, way, so we, we are, but we actually have decided we, we free up resources 
specifically to go into the new technologies or to support this industry for zero. Because if we, we don't do it now, then, uh, then we don't have it when we need it. And uh, we, want to be the lead we want to be in supply chain also a leader in this. So uh, that means certain functions are really uh, dedicated you know, strategically, uh, but we cannot forget the other functions. So we, we, there is a strong demand for um, operational support in terms of uh, manpower, in terms of uh, getting the supply chain smooth. And, um, and that's basically also our credibility. So we have to, we have to look at both, but we have, we have certain people, certain functions um, reserved for these new technologies. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And Stefan, you touched on it right at the beginning, yeah. really. You said that you've brought innovation into your process early. Yeah, actually, we, we, we did a couple of things. Um, although the, 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 the topic is a bit new, I would say, we most and all of us here innovate, but sometimes we don't know about it. So um, what we did was um, defining innovation. And uh, through something very simple, we said, Innovation is a new idea made useful. Um, because if you say innovation has to be disruptive, then you, you, you never end up with anything. Um, and, and second, we looked at um, a kind of um, symmetrical intentions with the outside world and uh, the world within. So we signed an agreement with um, an accelerator, an incubator of startups, which name is uh, Techstar. By the way, it's based in uh, Detroit. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's very automotive. And um, from within, we worked on how to unlock innovation. And basically, we are training uh, the people who have ideas that could be made useful to pitch um, via video what's their idea. Then there's a panel that meets every month, and we decide to fund or not teams, not individuals, teams that came up with idea that we think is going to be made useful. Mm -hmm. So our, our, our rate is going to be probably, it's like recruitment, you have 500 interviews and then uh, you have maybe 50 finalists for uh, two ideas that one day will be um, uh, go, going through a proof of concept. Um, but the idea is really to say, you have to balance the external and you also have to unlock what exists within, within the company. And a lot exists in any company, just that sometimes we don't see it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a red and green card question now. Um, and I, I don't think it's as simple as I'm going to make the question, uh, but still, um, it's tough. That's the question. <laughs> so the question is, how do you think you or, 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 or the industry, if you were looking at the industry, what would get an executive a promotion? Would it be, I've got the most innovative supply chain in the industry, or I've just knocked off $50 million off the cost of the supply chain? <laughs> what do you think will get your boss, your colleagues, or the industry in general get an executive a promotion? Would it be cost saving or would it be innovation and trying to do new things? Green card is for uh, innovation, red card is purely for cost. Okay. As expected. Yeah, so that gives us an idea. Uh, how, how is it to achieve cost reduction through innovation? Exactly. Well, that's, a, yeah, no, that's, that's why I was saying it's not quite as simple as I thought. But the clue, so for the ones with the green cards, maybe if you are going to be innovative, make sure it's something that cuts costs at the end of the day. <laughs> then you get the best of both worlds. Yeah. Uh, so then my question would be, what can be done? Or how do you innovate when all your resources are stretched? Actually, I'm sure your, mon your companies just throw money at logistics and supply chain. But if they didn't, <clears throat> how can you encourage innovation? So now the question, again, is about management and leadership, but perhaps it's up and down. How do you encourage or persuade your management uh, that they need to make investment, whether it's resources, whether it's change, bearing in mind what people think, uh, that at the end of the day it's going to be about cost cutting. But sometimes the cost cutting is, is slightly, not long term, but you know, an investment has to be made. So how do you manage up? How do you persuade? What processes did you do you have to go through? The complications. 
of trying to implement something new that might have cost-cutting implications, but in the meantime, can you give me a million dollars because you'll save it in a few years? So uh, what, you know, how do you manage upwards in that kind of case? Mr. Graffa. That's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, not a perfect, not a perfect answer to that one yeah. because I mean, how you to sell to sell something within the organization, um, and I mean, you would traditionally go for okay, there's a business case, but mm -hmm. that is questionable. Um, I mean, that's a tough one. I would say, in particular in our current setup, where yeah. mm -hmm. the focus is probably short term, a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, Cannot give you a good, no, that's fair a good enough. Strat a strategy for that one. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. I just asked the question, and the yeah. fact that it's confusing is an answer uh, in itself. Uh, Mr. Sorkin. We are probably the same. I think yeah. we have to run a very uh, yeah, our conservative or cost driven company, so we have to run through a business case and, and, and convince that. And probably if, if I would have the choice to do the trust sets, and probably I would um, alliance with a, with a startup uh, yeah. to. Because they have they have not all these business case all these requirements of the traditional company to to justify, but uh, they can basically you can be an angel therefore that uh, a certain amount. But yeah. basically, uh, there may be other uh, uh, means crowdfunding or so they can they can access have access to. But uh, in our case, that is uh, quite traditional and very very challenging to get the money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, first we start with talent reviews. Within, it's, it's an exercise that you probably all know about, trying to understand how, um, what's the health of your talent pool, basically, potential performance, etc. We also look at um, who could be mavericks. Hmm. For those who <laughs> have a US background, these are basically early adopters, um, always asking questions and sometimes desperate to get a project to be funded because they believe so much in it. Yeah. So we try to do this early on. Then I describe what we're currently doing, so video pitch, etc. Mm -hmm. But the mindset around this, it's not a question of, I mean, it, it, it becomes a question of money and time at some mm -hmm. stage. But it's not a question of uh, money to start with. It's more a question of mindset. And uh, we have two things. We say, if you never failed, it probably means that you never tried enough. Yeah. Which is easy. And second, there is a benefit in failure. Because as I said, the, the, the burn rate in terms of 500 to 50 to two, it's, it's, it's a huge burn rate, right? Mm -hmm. And you cannot invest in the 500. Mm -hmm. You can invest in the 50 moderately and quite, invest quite a lot in the two. So failing is in itself a learning. Because if I ask you all individually what you remember the most about your learning experiences, um, and it's very human, it's probably going to be your biggest failure. Because we learn from this. Mm -hmm. And then once you've learned, you try again, you may fail again, and at some stage, you'll succeed. Mm. So that's how we approach it. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna, I must be learning a lot because I seem to be fading a lot as yeah, well. So sure. that's the good news. <laughs> Again, a question for the red and green cards. Who feels, what's the word? Uh, uncomfortable, empowered to be innovative. Who feels that they're empowered to really try and do something different in their organization? I suppose green is who feels empowered to do something different. Who kind of feels... You know, we're, we have to do what the company does. And don't worry, the lights are really bright, so we can only see the cards, we can't see the people. <laughs> so green for empowered to innovate, red to wow. not empowered to innovate. So the good news is it, it is primarily green, <laughs> uh, which, which is good news. All right, you know, and, and probably surprising, which just goes to show that next time I ask that question, it should be through an anonymous voting survey as opposed to something that's visible. But, uh, but then we talked about how do you manage upwards. How do you manage 
not downwards, what's the correct expression, with your current team? How do, bearing in mind the questions that we've kind of had about the restriction, the problems, we can't think of how to manage upwards sometimes when there's cost restrictions, how do you encourage your team to be innovative and prepared to come to you with new ideas and crazy ideas and think, you know, there's a chance that this might be taken on board? Because we've heard the first two presentations and presentations throughout the day, blockchain, digitalization, but they... I'm not sure they really, we kind of talk about it, but I'm not sure if it's really being taken forward. And that's got to be by empowering people to bring it. How do you encourage your team to bring you these kind of ideas and, and not be too scared about being shot down and to have this continuous stream of ideas? Because it's not, one person's not going to come with a great idea that's going to solve everyone. You're going to have to encourage a, a constant stream of these ideas. Mr. Graffer. Um, I mean, from from in our current setup, and as we are within the group of PSA, obviously mm. now in a stage where we are transforming the setup. I mean, our teams from Opel and and PSA, mm. basically, we give them the ability to look at how processes and mm. uh, yeah, processes are being run currently in our organizations, and give them the ability to look at, at it and, and certainly we do have today some differences but then certainly the objective is to align it but they should come up with a proposal of what, what they learn and what they look at and what they find to be really the best for the overall corporation and uh, basically give them the liberty and the ability to look at it uh, without a direction to say it has to be that way, but basically come up and look at it from with the, with the right freedom and come up with own proposals on that way. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's um, a lot of positive things that we already see where we adopt um, the best practice so easily said from one or the other mm -hmm. organization. And um, I guess the key point is that we give the inspiration and the freedom to the people to, to look at it. Mm -hmm. Andres, so yeah, probably same. So I mean, we also have the traditional ways like idea management, yeah, mm. so that, which uh, which encourage we have now this uh, startup uh, little company mm. in the company. So uh, I think there is uh, also high interest um, uh, to get. I think if it costs a lot of money, uh, of mm. course we have the traditional challenges to to mm. do so. So we could uh, do some um, yeah submarine projects if we still have some money left at the end of the year. Then. And we, we invested in that uh, because next year it's not, not anymore more there. So that's some, some way how, how corporations work. And um, then basically we can, uh, we can also do it like a, a, a side project. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But uh, if it's come bigger, then there's more eyes on this. And then basically it's getting more challenging. Yeah? Mm -hmm. but I think whatever is good is that if it doesn't cost money, then we have more freedom to, uh, <laughs> to motivate the people to do it. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I would agree with, with, with both of you, actually. Yeah. Uh, I think um, you said it all. Communication is important and celebration of successes as well, because mm -hmm. this is inspiring for others to come up with ideas. But sometimes, you know, what happens in any corporation is that people invent something the top management doesn't know about, but still it's there and it exists. So yes. <laughs> we have to find it out. We, we, we have a couple of interesting examples. So. Um, Whenever top management is not ready to offer the money, um, some people find uh, smart solutions. Okay. And we have some HR development yeah. programs actually, which uh, force people to do a common project, also globally, yeah. and uh, then basically there are, uh, let's say, coaches internally yeah. who Mentors. basically have an have an issue in a daily business and basically can give it to them, and then this this teams work on that, and then it's also part of their HR program yeah, too. Yeah to uh, work internationally. Yeah. Okay, good. I've been asking most of the questions so far. One of the main reasons is whenever I ask a question, the cam camera comes on me. So I always like that. But, uh, you know, please, any questions, comments, suggestions, disagreements, arguments uh, from the audience, uh, please let us know. Please raise your hand if you've got a question. Any of the young millennials? No, <laughs> no, there isn't anyone. Um, so uh, any questions from the floor? No. Okay. All right. So what I'll do is uh, I'll move on to the, the voting survey now. 
So, uh, so if you've got the, get onto the app. Uh, hopefully you've downloaded it, hopefully because uh, we use it in the first session and we have had some questions through uh, on the app. So most of you, I think, have downloaded it. Uh, go on to the, where it says polling. And, uh, and then you'll see some questions that will come up, which are multiple choice questions as before. We'll ask a question. You've got 10 seconds to cast your vote. And, and then we'll give, the answer, we'll give the answer immediately this time round. So, uh, if you're ready, we'll, we'll ask the first question. Hopefully you've got it on your, on your, on your app now. I do say hopefully. So, the first question. Uh, how do you see, where is the growth going to come from uh, if you're in automotive and log logistics in Europe? Where do you see the growth to come from? Will it be more growth from Western Europe? Will it be growth in Eastern Europe? Will it be the resurgence, possibly, of Russia? Will, even though you're based in Europe, will the growth come from the Americas? Uh, will it be from Asia, from China, or other regions? Or will it be the development of Africa and Middle East? So if you can vote now, where do you think the big opportunities are for automotive logistics uh, in the future? And the answers are, in reverse order, <laughs> well, it's not going to come from IT, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you you should have asked more questions. I don't know, we seem to have some kind of, of hiccup in the questions. Uh, so before we go on to the next polling question, and it's a shame because I always love the World Cup question. Um, <laughs> uh, just to give you a reminder of what's happening at the end of this session, uh, you'll be, uh, if you at the end of the session, not now, uh, join us outside for some drinks, some cocktails, some canapes, some snacks, uh, and just some extra networking. Uh, which will be done at the back where the kind of lunch area is and the outside will be open there if you want to you know, <coughs> enjoy the, the wonderful sunshine from the German Riviera. Uh, and then at 6.30 to 6.40, um, if you can uh, then go on to the, the intercontinental cruise on my special yacht uh, that will be going uh, you know, uh, for, our, for our evening dinner. And just for your information, it will be docking back uh, back here uh, about uh, just after nine, so maybe nine fifteen, nine thirty. Uh, so the answer to the question, uh, to the first question, is uh, Asia. So we're expecting to, the growth. So even though you're based in in Europe, or perhaps based in Europe, the growth that you expect for the automotive industry is actually going to be in Asia. Uh, Eastern Europe uh, is second. Uh, and just so you know, obviously we do a conference uh, in Asia, in China every year, but the first time this year we'll be launching an Automotive Logistics Central in Eastern Europe conference, which will be in, will be in Hungary in November. So you'll be receiving more information on that over the year. Uh, but uh, just something to look forward to is uh, another European conference, but focused on Central Eastern Europe uh, in Budapest, in Hungary uh, at the end of the year. So the next question. Where will you be investing the most in the short to mid mid term? Will it be in hardware technology, kind of like drones, wearables, the kind of hardware, new technology coming from the hardware? Will it be in information technology? Will you be investing to make sure you've got the best data, blockchain, uh, uh, those kind of <laughs> things? Will it be in the traditional hardware? Will you be spending your money on assets, trucks, warehousing, and so on? Or will you be investing in people? Uh, so again, if you can answer now. That's a political correct one. So tough questions. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think. And we'll show you the answer in about 10 minutes. <laughs> oh no, we've got, it, we've got it fixed now. 
So information technology is where you expect most of the investment to go in. So traditional hardware people uh, are tied in second place uh, and not so much on the hardware technology, so drones uh, and things like that at this stage. Next question, please. Are you prepared for Brexit? So yes, we have a contingency plan. Yes, we're developing, developing a contingency plan. No, but we are looking at developing a contingency plan or what for, it's never going to happen anyway. So as someone in the UK reads all the British papers and re keeps up on British politics, I can tell you I've got no idea. But, uh, but what are you doing? Because it will have, we said, heard earlier in the vote, it will have a big impact on logistics in Europe, uh, logistics and supply chain in Europe. So what is your plan for Bre Brexit? So if you can vote now, please. <laughs> Have you got no faith in politicians anymore? Yes, so uh, interesting. Oh, but not um, politicians. <laughs> uh, and not, not, not particularly, you know, the yes, we have a good, strong contingency plan is the bottom answer. So I think if we actually had a similar vote in the UK government, I think we'd probably get exactly the same results. <laughs> uh, and uh, next question. What is your biggest current day-to-day -day issue? Is it, you know, you're particularly focused on planning for the future. Is it Brexit? Is it packaging, something that's coming up as a big issue for us in our conversations globally? Is it transport capacity? Is it waste reduction or cost cutting? Or is it risk management? What's your biggest focus on your day-to-day -day jobs? Again, vote now, please. So transport capacity. So we can talk about blockchains and drones and everything, but the biggest day-to-day -day issue is still the transport capacity. Uh, we've quite a strong, uh, quite a strong vote there. Second, they're planning for the future, and Brexit's got 0% of the votes. And again, we all have a plan. Yeah, of course, of course. And again, that would probably be the same issue if it was had in the UK government today. Uh, and then the next question. Which European country will win or go furthest in the World Cup? So will it be Brazil, Spain, got a great team, England, surely the favourites, France, a good young team developing, Netherlands, oh, I think I put Netherlands in by mistake, surely they must have qualified, no, terrible, Arsenal, who although they're a club team, they're probably the best team in the world, so perhaps should qualify for the World Cup in the future, or other. I don't know if there's any countries that we've missed on the list who've potentially got a, a chance to qualify for the World Cup. So again, if, if you can vote now, please. Thank you. Russia. <laughs> 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 But other. All the Italians. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it must, yes, yeah, so it's obviously a very strong contingent from some of the other countries. Uh, Mr. Hurdlemeyer, I don't know if Austria has qualified this year, but. Uh, and Arsenal got 6%, so I'm glad my son is in the room. That's good to see. So uh, I hope that uh, you will consider that for, your, for any betting you're doing on the, on the World Cup. Uh, it seems that uh, it could be another country other than England, but we will never know which country you really think uh, might win the World Cup. So uh, thank you very much for voting in the voting survey. Uh, I hope you found the results interesting both, uh, you know, we, we did have to have some s serious questions in there as well. So that was interesting. I'd particularly like to thank the panel for an interesting and honest a conversation on how you develop the automotive logistics and supply chain organizations of the future. So thank you very much to the three Andreases. Thank you.
And as I mentioned before, the evaluation forms, if you're leaving today, please complete them and hand them in at the front desk or, or just let us know uh, uh, or hand them in to individuals from our team or leave them on the tables and we'll collect them. But please complete them if you're leaving today. Uh, but otherwise, uh, join us for the, uh, for the drinks outside. We've got a great day lined up for you tomorrow, including think tanks and, and final panels, a uh, special session on the awards winners as well to find out how, uh, how to develop the right mindset and how to develop an award-winning uh, mindset and, and benchmarking and, and solutions. So we've got a great day lined up for tomorrow, but otherwise, enjoy your networking now in the in the in the in the cocktail reception uh, on the boat uh, have a great evening we'll see you bright and early at nine o'clock uh, tomorrow morning so thank you very much everybody thank you